Uh, welcome to uh, the talk. This is a talk about uh, a simulation we've been working on. This is uh, Gerald Collis. He's a good friend of mine, PhD, uh, just graduated, uh, and he's been working on, uh, on this type of stuff. Uh, I'm Kenneth Shaw. I work for IOActive, um, and I, uh, I hack things. I find vulnerabilities. I do all the good stuff. Um, but whenever I'm bored or in my free time, I like to do some types of research. And, uh, and I figured this would be uh, an interesting thing for DEF CON. Uh, it also happens to coincide that uh, a lot of customers are asking for this type of information. So, uh, so we basically built uh, a grid game. <laughs> it's a, a simulation of the West Coast grid. So. Okay, so a few uh, disclaimers. Um, uh, this is the type of thing where you don't do this at home because then the FBI comes to your home. Uh, it's a, it, I wouldn't recommend that you search for this type of information or you will end up on lists very quickly. Uh, we know what we're doing uh, for the most part. So just, just as a disclaimer, don't try this at home, kids. Um, uh, this is a, a more or less people who are in the field have been doing this for quite a while. Um, the information is not completely public, uh, and we'll talk about how I got some of the information that we have. Uh, but at the same time, yeah. And also, uh, it's this is the type of discussion that should be more in the public uh, sphere because of the issues that Internet of Things and like ADR and the smart grid types of uh, problems are going to bring to the grid that it was never designed for. So there needs to be some design changes in how things are done, else we will uh, run into some problems. So I'll hand it over uh, to Gerald, and he will talk about some power engineering things that is, are fairly important to understand uh, if you are interested in this type of stuff. So. Uh, so I'm going to keep this brief, having done a lot of academic work for four years, I, I'm tired of talking presentations, so I'm going to keep this real short. Uh, basically what you need to know about the grid and AC power is that all the electrons that are going through the lights, everything here, those were generated less than a second ago. So generation and load matches up basically instantaneously. So for that to happen, it's uh, basically frequency response. So everything's at 60 hertz in this country, 50 hertz in Europe because they're weird whatever, it's fine. Uh, but basically, um, if you studied physics and you did Ohm's law and that kind of stuff, when you get into AC, Ohm's law is a lie. That's important to know. It, I mean, not quite. But it's not V equals IR. It's actually V equals I conjugate Z, which means that it's a complex quantity. So there's actually a real and imaginary part to it, uh, which means you have real and imaginary power. And you don't pay for imaginary power, but it's important. And that's where it gets kind of weird. Uh, but frequency is actually the most important part. So uh, I'm going to show you some events, uh, some things I've been working with. Uh, we have a system called FNET, which is basically an oscilloscope for the power grid. And when a generator goes offline, it's like throwing a uh, rock sort of into a pond. So you get ripples that spread out and reflect and bounce. And it's really cool looking. But we can take that information and determine what happened, when it happened, where it happened, and get an idea of the overall effect on the grid. So this is the kind of stuff that has kind of directed our simulation, but we're not, uh, again, we're not encouraging anyone to go out and start tripping gens to learn how the grid works. That's a really bad idea. All right, uh, simulation-wise, so why do we do this? Uh, part of it, you know, why not? It's, it's kind of fun. It's something to try. Uh, again, it's a discussion that we should be having just because all of us at this point use electricity. You cannot be without it. Even if you're crazy and you go off the grid, you've got solar panels. I mean, seriously, you have internet, right? You need power. So uh, how did we do this? And even though I, as a power engineering student, had a lot of resources available to me, we made it a point to not use any of them. And part of that's because I'm lazy, but part of that is also we wanted to be sure that we weren't breaking any laws or going over any lines with this. This is all open data. Okay, so we did not use any privileged information. There is no uh, critical electrical infrastructure data here. There's nothing that's really important. So we have a lot of IEEE papers. There are a lot of open data sources from grad students and PhDs that put this out there in their own research. And then there's a little bit of domain knowledge in knowing what's important, but nothing like, hey, I have this model, we should use it. No, did not do any of that. 
And the game itself, we're going to put it out after DEF CON. It runs on a web server, and it's got some minor things. Basically, you go in, hack a node. It's a simulated hack. In no way are we teaching people how to break anything. But you can get effect of what happens if this uh, line goes out or this bus goes out. And you can see what happens to the grid. It's a much slower pace because it's running on a web server. There are a lot of limitations. We'll talk briefly about that. Okay. Got it. Okay, so this is the interface for it. It can be basically anything because it's a web page um, in the back end, and it's very difficult to see because of uh, the way the screen works. Um, so basically, there are 240 nodes in the simulation. Uh, I went through, and uh, like, like he was saying, uh, there were a bunch of PhDs uh, students who were getting uh, getting their stuff done. Don't move around a whole lot. You'll 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 make it all angry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, anyway, so there are 240 nodes. It's basically almost all of the important substations of the of the West Coast grid. And the reason why we did the West Coast grid is because it's a lot simpler. Uh, it's way faster to actually uh, calculate how everything is uh, shaping out here. Um, and kind of the general idea of this was how many different places can I poke at it? And before it causes it to basically collapse and not be actually a, a stable thing anymore. And Joe can talk about those whenever we look at the uh, uh, actual real events and what those look like when they happen. Um, so basically, the simulation is uh, not a very complex thing. Uh, in the future, we're probably going to try to do the East Coast and Texas because those are uh, the three grids of the United States. I don't know why Texas has their own, but. Because it's Texas. <laughs> anyway, so let's see. Well, what do we got next? Um, it's it uh, the 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 way the simulation is working right now. Um, I'm just randomly poking at it with 100 megawatt changes to either uh, increase or decrease generation or uh, increase or decrease load. And 100 megawatts sounds like it might be a lot, but it's actually pretty darn, darn small for the the grid. These types of fluctuations happen all the time. And as you can see, it's all green. It's all happy. Um, when, uh, if you hit the right types of places at the right types of times with those 100 megawatt changes, it can actually cause some very interesting effects on the entire grid. Um, because it's random and because it's meant for uh, demonstration purposes, uh, it, it doesn't look like it. But I found a couple of places and I've brought them out so that people can play with them uh, on, the, on the web whenever I put it out there. Uh, if you if you if you if you if you, if you uh, tap those at the right moments, then the entire grid will just you know blow up. Um, that's not necessarily something that is 100% uh, realistic, but it's pretty darn close based on uh, the fidelity of our model is actually pretty good. Um, but anyway, so let's look at some real grid events because those are actually cool. And so if you want to see this, it's in the ICS Village, um, and I can answer any questions you want there. Uh, but the the real interesting stuff is the actual events that have happened, and uh, actually I think we'll first start out with a, a simulation of the a simulation of the 2003 grid event. Let's see. No, come back. And I'll let Gerald talk about this one because it's his baby. All right, so the 2003 Northeast blackout was really what started all of this research, kind of what kicked it off, because this left 50 million people without power. It actually affected what the Earth looked like from space. It's kind of cool. Uh, and there were multiple failures here. See, here we go. There's a couple of lines that tripped here. No big deal. It's nothing uh, too abnormal. Uh, this was, again, August, a uh, hot summer day. So lines basically melt, fall into trees, short out, and then things open up. So what happened is that in the kind of the Midwest there, uh, MISO, Midwest ISO and First Energy were responsible for their little section of the grid. And unfortunately, the computer program they had monitoring all this, the SCADA, had a race condition in it. And what happened, that race condition happened to get triggered and the monitors froze. So all the operators said, no, hey, everything's fine, we're cool. And then uh, in the Northeast, <laughs> 
uh, up in uh, New York, they kind of said, you know, there's something that's going on here, and there was no real communication. They weren't talking. At the time, there was no federal oversight for the most part. Uh, so actually, First Energy didn't get punished for screwing up at all. Um, and, you know, at the time, nobody expected something like this because actually what happened, uh, the frequency reverberations came around through Canada and knocked things out because it's all interconnected. So what's happening here is you see uh, 60 is normal, and now we're at well under 60. That's really bad. And then when lines start to go off, this is basically the last one coming up here, and the system just collectively loses its mind. So this is where everything blacked out. And is that it? Yeah, that's it. Okay. So it stopped there. And basically, that's just the math falling apart because everything went away. Uh, and uh, again, this is 50 million people without power. It was failures on a lot of levels, but it was also on a human level. So it's important to know that this, this is not something necessarily you can just hack the grid and make this happen, but it's not out of the realm possibility in the future when we actually have more intelligent stuff. And again, you know, we wouldn't condone doing this at all. I wish I had simulations using maybe like the Chinese grid or something. It's more palatable, but we don't. This is a very interesting case study academically. Uh, what's the next one here? I think we have Florida. Yeah. So this is a pretty cool one. And yeah, so this uh, current here uh, at the bottom of the logo, that's a uh, University of Tennessee. So they put out these videos. They have a website you can go to and check all these out. It's kind of cool. What happened here is uh, in the southern tip of Florida there, that is uh, Turkey Point or Turkey Creek, I think Turkey Point, uh, generating plant, and that's about two and a half gigawatts. It's a new plant tripped offline. You can replay this one, by the way. Uh, and kind of what happens there is the, the frequency spreads. Whenever a generation trips, okay, you have temporarily less gen than load in the system, so the system has to compensate. So basically, whenever a generator trips, the fr system frequency goes down, and then the system will tend to overcompensate. Or when you lose load, frequency goes up. And the reason you see these different oscillations is because there's a delay. The system is trying to correct itself. So in a way, it's kind of like if you have a big slab of jello and you hit it with something, you know, it'll kind of fight itself. Ballistics gel or whatever you want to use. So that's kind of what you see the northeast and the northwest fight against Florida, and eventually it calms the system down. So this is... What? Yeah, this is, that's real time scale. So it does take a while, but what's interesting is each grid behaves slightly differently based on how dense it is. So it's almost like a material science issue, like if you uh, want to hear a train coming from far away, you actually put your ear to the track. Same kind of thing there, because it basically travels, waves travel faster in different grids, slower in others. Texas, I want to say, is the slowest. It's Texas. So, <laughs> the, sorry. Uh, this was actually TVA. Uh, what happened here was the storm system. And TVA is interesting because it's in the middle of everything. And it was just, I forget which hurricane this was from. But basically, we had one line trip off. These are 500 kV trips. And then shortly afterwards, because all of that current was redirected through the second line, we had a second trip coming up here. And right when it happens, you can just kind of see it spread yeah, and bounce all over the system. Because TVA is right in the middle of everything. So it's kind of a cool effect. And th this is one that got sorted fairly fast. It wasn't a big deal, but it gave us a pretty good insight into the system dynamics of it. Because the whole grid's basically interconnected. You have to think of it as one big machine. And that's what a lot of people, they can see a generator, they can see a relay. But it's, it's one of these things, you know, you want to put solar panels in your house. Okay, well, you are part of the grid. You're, you're part of this machine now. And the grid wasn't necessarily built with you in mind. And it's something that we need to fix and, and kind of work on. And our last one here, what's the last one? Oh, it's California, who cares? No, go ahead. Um, <laughs> okay, so this one, I'm trying to remember uh, exactly what happened here. There was a frequency sag all over the grid, and then basically kind of a brownout situation. Oh, that's right, yeah. And basically, the, uh, the coordination was, well, our frequency's kind of low. We need to drop some load here, so let's pick something unimportant. San Diego works. So here it goes. Yep. <laughs> but it fixes the grid, so who cares? Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's basically what happened there. So these are the kinds of things we would really love to do simulations on and show, hey, this is what happens when you knock something out. Uh, 
Obviously, our model doesn't look quite like that, as you saw on the website, because this is real data. This is recorded, processed in MATLAB, a lot of after effects, right? So this is basically after airbrushing, if you want to think of it that way, okay? There's, I, and part of the problem is power systems is, these are incredibly complicated systems. So you're looking at tens of thousands of nodes. Again, the math is complex, so you're not solving linear equations, you're solving simultaneous nonlinear equations. You're in complex planes. So this takes a long time to do, and actually all you do is guess. So you make a guess for every node in the system, and you figure out how close was that guess, and then you refine it, and computers can do this really fast, uh, people cannot. All right, so what's next for the sim? Um, you saw the nice pretty pictures of the, of the actual grid events. Um, we're gonna try to make that uh, work with OpenGL. Uh, it turns out that that's actually kind of a hard problem in terms of uh, computer graphic stuff, and I'm not very good at computer graphic stuff, so I'm, I'm getting some help with that stuff. Um, eventually, I'd like to make it look like that for the simulations, and I'd also like to do, um, I, I need to verify that the simulations are actually producing the, the correct type of stuff. So uh, the, the 2003 event that, we, that was simulated was done with actual information, like actual, actual data, uh, things that is not going to be publicly accessible. Um, but what I would like to do is, uh, based on what is actually out there and uh, simulation of the East Coast grid is try to reproduce those types of events to verify that all of the stuff that we're doing is actually correct. And then once we've uh, verified that, I would like to take a, you know, the next step and say what types of attack scenarios are possible. If, um, if there's like human errors or if an attacker is capable of lying about what uh, something is happening or able to hide uh, problems that are occurring in the, in the power system in the lines, um, you know, uh, act the alarms or make them not appear at all, um, that could be very interesting stuff for, for these types of scenarios. Um, another thing is, uh, uh, according to Gerald, the, uh, the, the grids, are, whenever they're created, they're not uh, designed to handle multiple problems simultaneously, but they can handle, they're quite resilient when they handle um, one problem at a time. So, uh, you know, poking at it like I, like, like I am with 100 megawatt stuff, eventually that causes it to, to die. Um, if I was to take out um, uh, enormous amounts of load like San Diego, you can tell what that happens, it's very quick. Um, but from an attacker's perspective, they not, may not want that because that only causes San, San Diego to drop out. They would want more of the grid to go out. So uh, I'm going to do some simulations to try to figure out what's the maximum uh, possible outage that I can cause with the minimum amount of effort. Um, and that's uh, probably going to happen over the next year. Um, other things that I'd like to do uh, is collect information that's not publicly available and pull it into kind of an open database so that people can, I guess, uh, also do the simulation stuff on their own because right now uh, this type of information is extremely expensive to get a hold of. Uh, it's basically impossible for anybody that isn't actually a grid, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, yeah, yeah, power gen. So um, anyway, those are the things that I'm working on next. Uh, if there's, uh, I think that's about it. Yep. So if there's any questions, uh, sure. Um, if you wanted a grid simulation of your own, it's about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It'd have to be like Power World or, or some. Software is used. Yeah, uh, like the software used and actually simulating this stuff. We're using a Python library, which, in retrospect, is not ideal after we've really come to understand it. Uh, but the software, the industry standard stuff, is you know you're looking at multiple thousand, probably twenty thousand dollars a seat at least renewable license and stuff like that. For anything that does it in any kind of real-time dynamic, like the speed we're looking at is actually a dedicated rack. So there's, uh, there are companies that put these out, but it's about a quarter million bucks to do a small system. There really, nothing exists for doing an entire system like this. We can look at historical data, but when you're talking real-time, you'll need something like a supercomputer, but the algorithms really don't exist for actually putting this into a a massively parallel process yet. That is one of those problems that if you can solve it, you make a lot of money. And we like money, so. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned uh, real power to imaginary power. Does uh, the model accommodate for reactive versus reactive load? And is that what you meant by the sort of 
Yeah. So basically, yeah, uh, reactive and inductive load. Uh, so basically, when you have uh, a reactive load, it consumes imaginary power. So it is important when you have a react or a basically inductive consumes it, and then a capacitor, capacitive load generates it. So imaginary power or reactive power is the more proper term, but mathematically it's imaginary. Uh, basically, that's power that is in the line and then kind of goes back and forth. And it has to be there for the voltage to be propped up. So without it, everything collapses, but it accomplishes nothing. So it's, I'm trying to think of a real world analog there. I'm not sure there really is one. It's kind of like water pressure, I guess, versus flow that. The, I've seen. Yeah. Right, and the thing is, it is actual current, right? It contributes to line heating because it goes back and forth, but there's absolutely nothing in terms of work done there. And the problem is companies can't charge for it, even though they all have to provide it. Uh, they can punish large customers. If you run a data center or some kind of industrial load, they're going to ask you to put capacitors there locally to kind of fix your, uh, your phase angles and minimize your reactive power consumption. And they can punish large consumers, but at the moment, homes don't do it. With smart meters, who knows? They, they might start charging for it because it's not hard to do. Oh, no, the load is represented as a complex quantity. So you can have, I mean, it's all aggregated because we're looking at 240 buses, right? So typically load is going to be a, a real, you know, P quantity, a real thing, and then a positive Q, meaning it's reactive, it's, it's inductive, right? Like a uh, heavy machinery or a washing machine, whatever. Because it's really rare to see a minus Q or a capacitive load. It can happen, and... The problem with it is, like a large data center, right, might have some capacitive load, but they're going to have all kinds of power smoothing stuff, and you are never going to see it come off because they're going to freak out if they have any kind of harmonic issues. So, yeah, thanks. Anything else? In some ways, yes. Uh, part of it is a discussion on how the grid was built, and it came up very organically. Uh, we finally settled on a common frequency back, you know, uh, I guess turn of the century, turn of last century, you know, Tesla and Edison and all that. There was some discussion on what frequency to use, not just AC versus DC, but yeah. <laughs> right, but now DC is more viable, and we might start seeing that in, in homes now, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, Chicago, I think, famously used to have a 33 hertz system, I want to say, and thankfully that's gone. Japan is split 50-60. I don't know why, but it is. Um, but anyway, yeah, for the most part, it's done pretty well, but the operating paradigm there has been basically power is generated at point A, and it's consumed at point B, and that's it. And the way these devices operate that kind of protect the grid and manage lines they look down the line, they look for certain current, certain impedance, and they're, they're, keep in mind these are electromechanical, or they used to be, now they're digital. And you can do a lot more with the digital relay than you ever could. So the electromechanical are looking for a certain impedance value, or really admittance, it's, it's done in the, as an inverse, a Y basically. But the, the important thing is to consider, it's looking for a certain target zone, and when the current or something goes wrong, and it's outside of that zone, it just assumes, okay, a tree branch fell on it, a squirrel messed up something up, let's open the line up. But they're only looking one direction. So the issue here becomes when you have solar panels, when you have wind, when you have everything changing rapidly, and say, because the sun might change, suddenly power is not going that way, it's going the other way. And it's easy enough to install devices to look both ways, and we're starting to do that, but it's a question of how flexible is the grid, how agile is it? And I've don't like that term, but that's kind of what it is. Uh, because when you have wind and you have a lot of energy coming from the Midwest and the wind just stops blowing or something, right, the grid has to respond very quickly. And without a lot of digital control, without reactive control, it can't really do that. A lot of these systems, you know, when you're monitoring the grid, uh, we're looking at the frequency, which is not a difficult thing to do, but the reason this technology is really just kind of coming to pass is that it requires GPS, it requires absolute synchronization of time. And to do that, you're looking at microseconds to analyze, you know, where the grid sits. And the thing is, 
for a long time, we didn't have this perspective on it. So now we understand more than we ever did. Loads are more sensitive now. The, the analog grid worked because we used analog machinery, used heavy machinery, and that's all left this country because we had no industry. But we do have data centers, we have capacitive loads, we have sensitive electronic devices now that need a higher power quality. So basically the load is changing. I mean, on some level, does everything need to be on the internet of things or whatever you want to call it? No, it doesn't. And that's, that's a discussion that the power industry needs to have, like what needs to be there, what doesn't. But there's, there's definitely an opportunity to use automation. The smart grid is a thing, it can happen. We still don't know what it is yet. They keep throwing that word around. They don't know what it means, but it is important. I mean, we can do stuff with it. Uh, like for what we were showing the events, I would consider that, you know, that's, that's a digital technology. We're getting a better understanding of the grid. And the scary thing is because the way it grew, we don't know much about it. This is a, a nightmare system that we created and we still don't know entirely how it works. It's, it's a little hand wavy. Right, yeah. We good? So I guess in, in some ways, uh, so when you increase the attack surface of something by adding those digital controls to them, that does seem like generally it's a bad idea, but when it was uh, poorly understood before and control still existed, then you're not really changing a whole lot necessarily. But at least when you do them, uh, at least when you uh, think about them, you can do the security audits, you can do all the things that we know that make security better. And uh, if you do them correctly, then you're better off than you were because before you had absolutely nothing to, to, to stop it, protect it, to even understand it, to, I guess, uh, quantize it, right? So, uh, and for the most part, the, these types of things actually don't actually cause changes. Um, so you can add a lot of monitoring stuff to get to learn and understand them. And that could help attackers uh, eventually, maybe. But uh, I think in 20, 000, or, or 2015, uh, we can start having discussions about what actual security means to these enormous physical monstrosities, right? So maybe that's another way to answer that. Yes, yeah, I mean, there, there, there have been digital controls for a very, very long time. Um, the problem is, is they were only added at, not necessarily uh, for security purposes or understood in terms of security, but they were added for control and for maintaining the actual grid. So um, I think uh, when we start discussing the actual security of it, we can at least isolate the, the parts of it that are very brittle and, uh, and, 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 and look to the future for actually um, making them very resilient to other types of attacks, for example, cyber types of attacks. So that's the types of things that I'm, I do that all the time, so yes, I'm interested in that. One of the fundamental challenges seems to be the, the ICS protocols that is linked with software for these devices, right? So right. how much can I do if I still got to run Modbus and EMP3? I've been preaching EMP3 secure offer since, and they just laugh, right? Like, ah, ah. Right. So, right, and and it's been that way for forever. And even though the rest of the, I guess the, if you want to call it the cyber world, has been uh, learning and understanding how to actually make secure systems, uh, it's unfortunate. But the ICS uh, world is is way way far behind. And I see this all the time. And and, and this I, I talk about it with, uh, with my friends all the time. This is what we do. Um, if there is no path forward. Um, then it's never going to get better. And you, uh, if the industry isn't going to demand it, then somebody should. And that's why I think these types of discussions should be more public because otherwise nothing is ever going to change. And while um, the grid is extremely brittle uh, in terms of the controls and things that are on it, because of the protocols, they're just absolutely horrible. And even something like DMP3 with the secure auth, which was done 
you know, a million years ago, it still is not actually widely implemented. So that's a thing. Um, it's because uh, uh, there's no, there is no momentum. There's no uh, force driving uh, people to actually make these types of changes. So uh, I think bringing uh, bringing the vulnerabilities to light, bringing what the the possible damages that are possible uh, would would drive a public, uh, I guess. Uh, force to actually make these changes when the industry won't do it for us because at the end of it uh, We're the ones that are going to suffer when something bad happens and the industry with their Regulatory bodies and lawyers will actually probably get off scot-free So this is not something that should probably happen and that's I, I mean very punitive, but uh, I think yeah Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I agree with you that the protocols are all completely outdated and it's really kind of shameful the problem is the perspective of the power industry and just how it's grown up. So these are people that make capital equipment decisions. They buy a transformer, they buy a, a generator. I mean, it's, there are some nuke plants where power companies built a lake to have the plant there. I mean, this is, you know, it's a completely different discussion than we need to install a computer. And part of it is they look at equipment over the life. The, the engineer that installs it is not going to be there when it finally fails or gets decommissioned. Or it, if he is, it's going to be entire career. And so when you start talking about devices that are going to get replaced every five to ten years, when you t talk about adding certain digital piece of equipment to a substation, right, it still has to communicate with the old stuff. Like you said, transmission on some level, we've had some digital logic for years, and that's absolutely true, but by no means was it like super intelligent. You know, we, we didn't have any kind of real security there beyond it's in a substation, it's kind of obscure, and really, who wants to knock out the power? And for the most part, I don't think people do, uh, you know, not in, not in your own country. So and that's kind of the thing, but yeah, but when you're looking at it like, you know, let's just all get a new standard, that's fine. We, we easily could get a new standard, but the problem there is when you go on a sub and you say, well, I have a device that speaks the new standard, well, nothing else does, so you're back to speaking, you know, Morse code, basically. And this is the problem we have. Uh, the, the new devices, the things that measure frequency and phase, those are called synchrophasers. We have a standard out for that. It's one of the newest IEEE standards. It actually just revised in 2011, but it pretty much came out in 94, which makes it one of the newest ones. And there was a big complaint when they moved over from 16-bit values to 32-bit values of the standard. And this is stuff that, whatever, it shouldn't be a big deal, but it is because you have legacy equipment. So then it's a, an issue of integrating what's the back-end cost and, and what's all this. And again, power companies, they, they deal in bulk. The margins on energy are not fantastic because it's heavily regulated. Like, they will always make money. It's a stable job. There's no problem there. But they're not making a ton of money that they can just go out and redo everything when they have to. Okay, so NERC SIP is well intentioned. It's, I mean, it's actually, it has a lot of really good ideas in there that this is a critical device. You should secure it. You should be very careful with where the data goes and how it's treated. The problem with NERC SIP is the enforcement because the way it works, if a power company does something, they want to try an experiment and they get it wrong, the punishment is huge. And it's because of how that works, it's a disincentive to try something new. And from a, you know, they have shareholders, they have a business to run. So it, it comes down to let's be conservative. And this is already a conservative industry. I mean, keep that in mind. So when you're trying to push cyber stuff on them, on some level, they're the guys in ops that they absolutely get the value of all the new equipment. They completely see it. But at the end of the day, you also have to feed it to the operators. And the operators have to make these decisions, and you can't just dump terabytes of data at them every day and expect them to get anything out of it. So there's some intelligence there. There's some, there's got to be some kind of automation. But again, if the automation screws up or it gets hacked or something, and it turns out that you weren't in compliance because of something obscure, right? Then you're going to get fined a million bucks a day. And that's suddenly not worth trying it. And that's kind of the issue. But NERCSIP as a, an idea is great. It's just there needs to be some kind of clause as, you know, a, a, like a good faith initiative. Like, we're going to try something. Don't beat us if it goes wrong. 
Yeah. Okay, so the CMEs, that's, that's a fun one because we've only had, I want to say there's two confirmed cases of that. There's a couple suspected and it's always up north. You have to go to Canada. The only confirmed one I know about is Finland. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, sorry, it's uh, CME's coronal mass ejection or solar flare basically. And the idea there is you have a solar flare, particles come, plasma hits the earth, and it couples magnetically with lines that run east-west and induces a current and faults a transformer. That has happened up north. That's basically the aurora. When this happens sometimes, and I think there's a record of it in like the 1700s before then was electrified, you could see the aurora in Italy when there was a big one. But they didn't have power, so it wasn't an issue. In theory, if that happened to us again, there might be some issues. Part of it, though, is transformers are really old, and they're actually, that's a good thing because they're over-designed. They have way more core metal than they need. They can sink a lot of extra current. I won't say it's a non-issue, but it's not a doomsday scenario. So it's, you have to, to kind of rationalize it. It could happen. It won't take out every piece of electro, you know, it won't take out the whole planet. It's possible that up north there may be some issues, but again, it's something that if there's enough detection, it doesn't have to be huge, but if there's enough stuff in the transformer, say, oh, hey, there's a, you know, a kind of circulating current in the core here, let's isolate it, open it up, it's fine. And the transformer shouldn't, from a, a short burst, shouldn't break. It is a concern if a transformer breaks because it's a huge piece of equipment. Uh, large power transformers are basically buildings unto themselves. They are huge, massive. So they're built in place. So yeah, I wouldn't, like the sky's not falling on that one, but it's worth putting some money into it, but it's kind of a, you know, don't freak out. Anyone else? We're good, I think. So uh, thank you for coming. Uh, if you have any questions or you'd like to see the, the simulation uh, happening, come check us out in the ICS Village. Uh, Jason Larson will be uh, shrinking his barrel at 3, 3 p.m. this afternoon. Uh, so come check that out. It's a lot of fun. It goes off like a gunshot. Uh, I appreciate everybody. And, uh, yeah, come check us out. Thank you.